The title of our sermon this morning is Christ My Joy. Christ My Joy. And we've come to John chapter 15 verses 9 through 17. And considering all that we have before us, this is such a, a meaty text. I'm going to ask for somebody to take the battery out of that clock uh, next, before next week. We, there's just so much to cover, so many things to be said. Uh, so we're going to take probably this week and next week, getting through this text, uh, we want to take some time and just rejoice in the Lord uh, for this truth. And we have much, much, much to rejoice over. Christ my joy, John chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. Now, I want to set this up for you, set the stage, set the table, so to speak. And I want you to think with me, consider with me what life must have been like in the Garden of Eden prior to the fall. Think about that with me for a moment. God, who is himself perfect, saw everything that he had made in Genesis 1, and he said that it was very good. Adam and Eve were flawless, right? No warts. There was no death. There was no sickness. There was no disease, no trouble, no danger. There was no arguing. There was no bitterness no anger, no short tempers, no selfishness, no enemies. There was no pain. There was no discomfort, no anxiety, no fear, no hardship, no difficulty, no toiling by the sweat of your face to eat bread, right? The world itself, Adam and Eve, very good in God's sight. The world, very good in God's own perfect eyes. No thorns, no thistles, no weeds to pull. There was no drought. There was no Zika virus. There was no poverty, no flooding rain, no disasters of any sort. Never too hot, never too cold. Dogs never bit. Cats didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> but most importantly... <laughs> and most necessary to the joy of Adam and Eve in the garden, there was this perfect and unbroken fellowship with their creator, God. Adam and Eve enjoyed uncorrupted, unpolluted, unfettered intimacy with God. Now, prior to the curse in Genesis 3, God is described as walking in the garden in the cool of the day. What an awesome thought, right? What an awesome thought. Now think about this with me for a moment. Adam has a body. Adam has a body. Its needs, desires, appetites, senses, all satisfied by God. Fully by God. Adam has a mind. His thoughts employed in the tasks given to him by God. His thoughts filled and exercised every day with the knowledge and worship of God. Adam has a will, his will in perfect alignment with the will of God. Adam has emotions, his emotions perfectly informed by God. Emotions that reflect a perfect trust in God, emotions that delight in God. Adam had a conscience, a strong and informed conscience, perfectly clear and affirming of God's law before the fall. Untainted by guilt, his actions were in perfect alignment with God's standards, and so his informed and strong conscience was continuously clear. Adam has a soul, and his soul perfectly satisfied and never dying in relationship to his God. Adam's body, Adam's senses, his mind, his will, his emotions, his conscience, and his soul all finding their ultimate fulfillment, their ultimate satisfaction, their ultimate end, their ultimate delight in God, his creator, with whom he has perfect fellowship. Now, if we could describe or define joy, that would be it, right? Everything that you are satisfied in God. Everything that you are in perfect alignment with his will, his purposes. God delighting in you, you delighting in God, that's joy. And the desire for that joy 
as contrasted or as set apart from the joy often that we speak about, the fleeting happiness of this world, the desire for that joy, that kind of joy, is woven into the very fabric, planted deep within the heart of man, whether he recognizes it or not, whether he acknowledges it or not. Having just a foretaste of that kind of fellowship with the Lord led David to conclude, in your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So then, what happens in Genesis chapter 3? Genesis chapter 3. Against all of that, against all of that, having body, mind, will, emotions, conscience, soul, all satisfied supremely and completely in God, against all that, Adam sins. And now we all are born in sin. We sin in Adam. Because of the fall of man, sin entered the world and death through sin. Hate, anger, malice, murder, lies, conflict, covetousness, greed, envy, selfishness. With all of that sin came danger, disease, sickness, pain, hunger, thirst, adversity, difficulty, trouble, despair, woe, agony, and want. Wickedness abounds in this world. Abounds in this world. Job said now that man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. The world that was in the eyes of God very good was now cursed by God and subjected to futility. God told Adam prior to casting him out of the garden in Genesis chapter 3, God said, cursed is the ground for your sake, Adam. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And he said, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. The whole world, the whole world, now the whole created order, subjected to futility, cursed by God, and now all of it lying under the sway of the wicked one. Man by God's design, naturally desires joy. Naturally desires joy. But now, born in sin and an enemy of God by his wicked works, he seeks that joy in a host of ways that are all bound to be ultimately unsatisfying. Can't have joy apart from God. You can't have joy apart from Christ. In an attempt to find true joy, man seeks to satisfy his body with fleshly and temporary pleasures. Man, in an attempt to find joy, occupies his God-given mind with empty entertainments, temporary pursuits, temporary pleasures. He's emotionally unstable at best. His emotions are tossed to and fro by his circumstances, wrought with sorrow one moment, nagging emptiness, and then temporary joy or temporary happiness the next, unstable at best. This pursuit of joy on the part of man is even built into our own declaration of independence, isn't it? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now, of this kind of futile pursuit of the world's joy, we have a very preeminent example in the Bible. That's the example of King Solomon. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. This is foolishness. This pursuit of joy, this pursuit of happiness apart from Christ apart from that restored, perfect fellowship with God, is a vain pursuit. We see the Bible's preeminent example of this foolishness in King Solomon, recorded in Ecclesiastes. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. 
Here's what Solomon said. He said, I said in my heart, come now and I will test you with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. But surely this also, Solomon concluded, was vanity. I said of laughter in verse 2, madness. And of mirth, what does it accomplish? I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. I made my works great, verse 4. I built myself houses, planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards. I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. I acquired male and female servants, had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasure, treasures of kings and of the provinces. I acquired male and female singers, the delights of the sons of men and musical instruments of all kinds. So I became great and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor in which I had toiled, and indeed... All was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Empty, vain, right? Why is there no profit profit to seeking temporary joy in this life? Why is there no profit? Are you are you a body only? <laughs> no. You have a soul. You have a material part and an immaterial part. You're not merely a body opposed to what atheists or evolutionaries might say. You're not only a physical body. Then let me ask you, can you find true joy then in merely satisfying your physical needs? No. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 6 verse 7, all the labor of man is for his mouth and yet the soul is not satisfied. Listen to Solomon from chapter 8, verse 15. He said, I commended enjoyment because a man has nothing better under the sun than to eat, drink, and be merry. For this will remain with him in his labor all the days of his life, which God gives him under the sun. So he commended enjoyment. He commended entertainment. Listen to Solomon in chapter 11, verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. Let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your own heart and in the sight of your own eyes, but know this, that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. For us to find true joy, for us to have true joy, our highest needs must be met. The greatest needs and desires and wants of our soul must be satisfied. And there's only one to whom you can go for that true and lasting joy. There are those who have present happiness in this life, right? You know people that do. Health, right? They've got a nice home. People around them they care about. A job they like. Money in the bank. To seek joy, they give themselves to a cause. They give themselves to work. They give themselves to family. Give themselves to making money. Give themselves to that boat right? That next possession. But think about it. Can they, can they really look with joy at death? That was what was, what Solomon was experimenting with here or exploring in Ecclesiastes. Can they look with joy at all their sin? Can they look with joy to meeting God in judgment? No. You live for joy in this life. You can't look past the end of your own nose. Your conscience is defiled. You're guilty before God. Your soul is unsatisfied. And you know that you'll be held, account, held to account for the life that you live. 
Their soul is unsatisfied. They're guilty. Their conscience is defiled. J.C. Ryle says, their boasted happiness is a poor, unreal thing. It is but a whited sepulcher, fair and beautiful on the outside, but bones and corruption within. It is a mere thing of a day, like Jonah's gourd. It is not real happiness. You know, Solomon came to that conclusion. Solomon's final assessment, here's what he said in chapter 12, verse 13. He said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Why? Because God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. What God has done in Christ through the gospel is to redeem fallen sinners. And in redeeming falling, fallen sinners, what God does is to begin that work, if you will, of restoring them to the place of the garden, so to speak, where they find their ultimate soul's satisfaction and all their joy in him alone. That is God redeeming us to himself in Christ. Now certainly, in the next life, where all our troubles are going to come to an end, all our troubles cease. But even in this life, while we face trouble, we can have a foretaste of that joy. We can be joyful in him in this life. We can say with the prophet Habakkuk in chapter 3, verse 17, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord and I will joy in the God of my salvation. Amen. Christ is our joy. If you're in Christ, then that joy transcends your circumstances. He is our joy. He is our hope. He's our portion, our inheritance forever. As we come to John chapter 15 then, in verses 9 through 17, as we study verse by verse through the gospel of John, the Lord's concern now in this section of text is that we find our soul satisfaction. We find our soul's delight. We find full joy in him alone. Now, this is foundational to being a Christian. This is foundational to being a Christian. This is what a Christian is, is this joy in him. He says in verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Now, think about it with me. In verses one through eight, he tells us to abide in the vine to bear fruit. He warns us that we'll be fruitless apart from him. He assures us that he hears and he answers our prayers. He points us to the glory of God in all our efforts. In verses 9 through 17 now, he reminds us to abide in his love by keeping his commandments. To love one another as he has loved us. He reminds us that we are more than just servants. In fact, he calls us friends and that we've been chosen and appointed by him to bear fruit. And in all of this, he says, I have spoken these things to you so that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Christ is my joy, amen? Christ is your joy. I want you to see now several ways in which this is supremely true for the Christian right? Several ways in which this is supremely true for the Christian. And we see this outline for us in John chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. First thing I want you to see on your notes, his love is my joy. His love, my joy. The Lord begins in verse 9 with a staggering reality. And I, I am just <laughs> amazed at thinking about this, even to this day, right? It's just a staggering, astonishing truth. And sometimes it's so difficult for Christians to believe this, and we wouldn't believe it if it weren't written on the pages of Scripture, right? Look at verse 9. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Now that little word, as, at the beginning of verse 9, is a glorious little word, all right? Glorious little word. In the same way that the Father loved me, just as the Father loved me, 
I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Let me ask you, does the father love the son? Yes, he does. With an infinite, immeasurable love. And the love relationship between the father and the son here becomes the basis for, or the best analogy for, the best description of the love relationship between Jesus Christ and his disciples. I want you to see this. The word loved there in verse 9, we see it there in the past tense, but that's translating for you Greek guys, that's translating an aorist in the Greek. And what that means is this, it's not really communicating as much past tense as it is a completed thought. The love that the father has for the son is an established reality. He loves the son start to finish, right? It's like back in John chapter 13. He loved his own who were in the world and he loved them, ace telos, into the end, right? He loved them to the end. The love that the father has for the son is a completed, established, unquestionable, inviolable reality. And that's the way the Lord loves his own. That's the way that he loves you and I. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, start to finish. Now get this, John, writing the gospel here, John chapter 15, would later write in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, he wrote this, listen, love has been perfected. Now that there is a completed reality. Love, and he's speaking of the love that God has for us, the love that Christ has for us, that love which Christ has for his own has been perfected, has been completed. It's been a completed thought, an established reality, start to finish. He loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end, completed among us in this so that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. How can we have such boldness, right? How can we have such confidence before God in the day of judgment? Because, John says, as he is, so are we in this world. I'll let that sink in for a moment. I mean, that is a staggering reality. As the Lord Jesus Christ is to God in the eyes of God the Father, as the Lord Jesus Christ is, so are we in this world. Speaking of the love of God for his own. I'm just blown away by that statement, right? It gives me joy to think about that love for me, the love that Christ has for me, the love, that God has, the love that God has for you if you're in Christ. Is that because you're so lovable? <laughs> no. <laughs> I will attest to that and so will your brothers and sisters. <laughs> no, it's because of Christ, because of what Christ has done. He loves us that way in him. Now, as, as genuine Christians then, in reality of that truth, as genuine Christians then look forward, look ahead to facing Christ in judgment. They can face that with, ju- with boldness. Why? Because as he is, so are we in this world. God loves his own as he loves his own son. And you think about that. God has clothed them in his son's righteousness. God has clothed them with his son's perfect righteousness. That's a a completed act. He doesn't look at my filthy rags anymore. He doesn't look at my filth. He sees me in Christ clothed in his perfect righteousness. He looks on the perfect obedience of his own son and he loves me as he is, so am I in this world. Isaiah pointed forward to this in chapter 61, verse 10. He said, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. Why? Because he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robes of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. That love, because it's in Christ, right? And because it's clothed, if you will, or pointed toward the righteousness of his own son, that love is unconditional. That love is gracious. That love is immutable. That love is sovereign. That love is unwavering. It's unfailing. It's permanent. That love is perfect. 
It is, in God's sight, it is very, very good. And that perfect love casts out fear because fear, John says, involves torment. That has practical application in our lives, doesn't it? How you live, how you think about the Lord, how you think about your Christian life, how you think about your circumstances, that has impact in the way that we live. It should. There's a story of um, Nicholas Ridley, and I love reading some of those stories about those faithful brothers and sisters, those martyrs. And Nicholas Ridley, in October of 1555, went to the stake in Oxford, England, to die for the faith. On the night before his execution, he's in prison, and his brother comes into him. And his brother, knowing that Nicholas Ridley was going to die the next day, offers to stay with him through the night, wanted to encourage him, wanted to be with him in his last hours. Ridley refused and told his brother to go home that he planned to go to bed early that night. <laughs> now that I think about this for a minute. He told his brother that he intended to sleep as quietly as he ever did in his life. He wanted to be rested and ready for the next day. Now, if you think about it, that shouldn't sound that unusual or that heroic to, to Christians. We understand that, don't we? If you have faith in Christ, having confidence of God's love toward him, he wasn't fearful, he was bold. And that's boldness is something you'd expect to find from someone who has his fullness of joy, his soul's satisfaction in Christ alone. Now, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, the Lord by his spirit is going to produce joy in you. That kind of joy, that joy is a transcendent joy. It's not based on your circumstances. Like Nicholas Ridley, that joy in Christ transcends your circumstances, and that's a joy that we learn as the Lord matures our faith. It's a joy that we grow up into, but it nevertheless is a joy in the Lord that you can't find anywhere else. And the Lord will even ordain adversity so that we learn that joy through our trials, through our difficulty. You face difficulty, you face adversity as, as a Christian. Count it true, God is teaching you to learn that joy, teaching you to to rejoice in him alone. There's a, a beautiful hymn by John Newton, and I love this hymn. Listen to the words of this hymn. I ask the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. I hoped that in some favored hour at once he'd answer my request and by his love's constraining power subdue my sins and give me rest. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart. And he let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yea, more, with his own hand he seemed intent to aggravate my woe. Crossed all the fair designs that I'd schemed, blasted my gourds and laid me low. Lord, why is this, I trembling cried. Wilt thou pursue thy worm to death? Tis in this way, the Lord replied, that I answer prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that thou mayest seek thy all in me. We need to ground our joy in his love for his own. Ground, root your joy in his love expressed for you. As he is, so are you in this world. It's a staggering thought. But in that thought, in that thought, we can have joy in him. It's a joy that we can't find. You cannot find in anything else. End those vain pursuits and joy in your salvation. Joy in Christ your Lord. His love, my joy. A poor man 
abiding in the love of Christ will have joy in Christ despite his poverty. A sick man abiding in the love of Christ will have joy in Christ despite his sickness. You and I, we aliens in this wicked world, abiding in the love of Christ for his own, will have joy in Christ despite this wicked world in which we live. But then in John 15, he takes that reality, he takes that reality, and he concludes it with a command in verse 9. Having made a tremendous statement about his love for us, then he commands his disciples to abide in that love. In verse 9, abide in his love. Jude says it this way in verse 21 of Jude, keep yourselves in the love of God. In other words, remain in the place where you can experience the constant joy of knowing that love. Stay in the place where he can lavish that love upon you, where you can experience his joy and your joy can be full. Now, how do you do that? Verse nine, how do you abide in his love? Well, it's pretty straightforward in verse 10. Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. You obey him. We abide in his love through obedience. Second point on your notes, I want you to see his delight is my joy. His delight is, is my joy. We abide in that delighting love of God for his own by keeping his commandments, right? By obeying him. Look at verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Now notice first here that we don't earn his love by our obedience. We, it says here in verse 10, abide in that love through our obedience, now, he explains this again, once again, using his own example. And we're going to have to unpack this a little. He explains using his own example that you keep my commandments and abide in my love just as or in the same way that I kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So let's begin. Now, looking at verse 10, unpacking what it means for us to abide in his love by obeying his commandments, let's unpack what it looks like in his relationship to the father how he keeps or abides in his father's love by obeying his father's commandments, right? Consider the Lord's relationship to the father. Is Jesus Christ loved by the father? Yes, eternally, immutably, infinitely, immeasurably, perfectly. All that's been established, all right? Think about this. Can anything ever separate God the son from the love of God the father? No, nothing. The love of God the Father for him is like a completed thought. It's a completed thing. It's established, start to finish, settled in the heavens. All right? Then what does it mean then for him to abide in this love? It means, for Jesus Christ, it means obedience. It means for him, obedience. Turn with me just a few pages to the left. Turn with me back to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. For Jesus Christ to abide in the love of the Father, he keeps his Father's commandments. It's pretty clear, right, from the text, verse 10. Look at John chapter 8, and look at verse 28. How does the Lord describe this, this keeping of the Father's commandments? How is this described? Verse 28, Jesus then said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. When he's talking about lifting up the Son of Man, he's talking about the cross. His obedience to the point of death, even the death of the cross, okay? When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak, and you could say of Jesus Christ, and I do these things. Verse 29, he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. Now, why? Because Jesus Christ is abiding in the Father's love. And he's abiding in the Father's love by the end of verse 29. I always do those things that please him. Look at verse 29 again. He who sent me is with me. The Father's not left me alone. Why? 
for I always do those things that please him. God the Father, with God the Son, delights in him. God the Father delights in God the Son because God the Son always does those things which please him. He delights in Christ because he always does those things which please him. So what does it mean to abide in his love? Knowing that that love is a settled fact, knowing that that love is immutable, unchangeable, infinite, eternal, immeasurable, perfect, Knowing that love is a settled fact, a completed thought, what does it mean to abide then in that love? It means doing those things which please him, those things in which he delights. Now that leads us into verse 11 and to our joy. His delight is our joy. Christ tells us these things, right? Tells us, gives us verse 10, so that his joy would be in us and that our joy would be full. It leads to our joy. Now, I want to give you a couple of statements here, again, to help so that we don't get ourselves into error thinking about these things, right? Here's the first of those. From verse 10, our obedience is a condition for remaining in his delighting love. Can't get around that. That's what the text says. All right, I want to repeat it. Let that sink in. <laughs> Our obedience is a condition for remaining in his delighting love. So if you have difficult with the, difficulty with the conception of obedience in the Christian life, then you're going to, go, you're going to have to just rip that verse out of your Bible. <laughs> D.A. Carson said this, However much God's love for us is, us is gracious and undeserved, continued enjoyment of that love turns at least in part on our response to it. Now settle that in your heart and mind. Our obedience is a condition for remaining in his delighting love. Here's the second point I want to make. From verse 9, his delighting love is the fountain of, and motivation of our obedience to him. The initiative, the fountain of our obedience, the motivation for our obedience, the strength of our obedience, the power for our obedience, the fuel for our obedience, the initiative always comes from God. The power always comes from God. The motivation always comes from God. We don't merely obey out of fear or out of obligation, and we don't do that in our own grit. Right? We don't do that in our own power, in our own strength. We render obedience out of love for God the Father. And even that love is a gift from him. His delighting love is the fountainhead and motivation of our obedience to him. Thirdly, we can deduce then that our obedience is a fruit or is the evidence of the reality of that love. Our obedience, a fruit, or the evidence of the reality of that love. A disciple, then, is not just a learning follower. A disciple, then, is a learning, loving follower. <laughs> loving the Lord Jesus Christ with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is how Christ abides in the love of the Father. And all of this is how we are to abide in his love. And all of this is according to the grace of God. The Bible says, Paul says, right in Philippians, it's God who is at work in us doing what? To will and to do according to his good pleasure, according to his delight. We serve him. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We enter into the Christian life. We do those things. We do those things which please him. Why? Because it's God who is at work in us to do what? To do that which pleases him. To do that through us and in us that is for his good pleasure. As I abide in his love, he delights in me and he lavishes that love upon, upon me in joy and delight in him, all of which is a gift from God. Now we see that in three ways from our text. If you're under second point on your notes there, his delight, my joy, there are three ways in which we experience that abiding love or that abiding delight. 
First, it's when I obey like him. When I obey like him, always goes back to his example. We experience that delight, my joy, when I obey like he obeys. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. His abiding and delighting love should be my motivation, right? Now, many people tend to be nervous about teaching that we need to delight God or please God with our obedience. They're nervous about that. And I understand, all right? They don't want to undermine or they don't want to subvert justification by faith alone in Christ alone. And we don't want, we wholeheartedly affirm that glorious doctrine. We're not undermining that in any way here. But we delight God and his abiding, delighting love should be our motivation. We do that through our obedience. Many, because of the neglect of churches and the neglect of pastors or the neglect of teachers to teach these things, many undermine or misunderstand or ignore the importance of obedience in their life. It is critical that we abide in his love by obeying his commandments. And that not in our own strength, that not of our own doing, that in and of itself is a grace of God, a gift of God. Samuel said this, the prophet Samuel, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, Samuel says, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Consider the testimony of the New Testament. Colossians chapter one, verse 10. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Kids, Colossians chapter three, verse 20. Obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Remember, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Can't do anything apart from faith and please him. Romans chapter 12, using a different word for pleasing or delighting God. Romans chapter 12, verse one, using the word acceptable. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship, your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We delight in him. His delight becomes our joy when we obey like him. We're going to get into these more next week, but his delight is our joy when we rejoice like him. Look at verse 11, John 15, verse 11. When I rejoice like him, these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. You know, the Christian life, <laughs> we see it characterized this, this way so often, right? The Christian life, just a, a whole big mess of do's and don'ts, right? Things I gotta do, and things I got to avoid. And it's this burdensome, joyless set of restraints. <laughs> it's like you're tied down, chained up, roped in. Christian life is not joyless legalism. It's not heartless ritual. It's not some kind of beating you over the head and shoulders with the law, and you gutting it out in your own strength. The Bible says that the Christian life is filled with joy unspeakable. Joy that you can't even talk about. You don't know how to describe it. <laughs> John chapter 16 the Lord says to his disciples, you're going to have grief now. When I see you again, you will rejoice. The Bible says that sorrow may be for a night, but what? But joy comes in the morning. 
His delight is my joy when I obey him. His delight is my joy when I rejoice like him. But his delight is my joy when I love like him. Look at verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You're my friends if you do whatever I command you. We'll get into this more next week. The Christian life is not a works righteousness. It's not working to earn salvation. That salvation is a glorious gift of the grace of God in Christ for those whom he has chosen to love. You can't earn his delight. You can't earn his love. It must be done by faith in Christ. You know, I'm reminded, I was uh, reading this past week a story, an article about Mother Teresa. Uh, Mother Teresa has been given sainthood in the Catholic Church, and I um, was thinking about her life and some statements that Mother Teresa had made that this article in Time Magazine had uh, illustrated. And Mother, Mother Teresa's life, her theology, was a works righteousness. It was a works righteousness. You had to work. And she put her joy and her faith so to speak, in that work. She encouraged Hindus. She encouraged Muslims, Buddhists. You can look this up for yourself. I'm not making this stuff up. She encouraged Muslims, Buddhists to be better Hindus, better Muslims, better Buddhists. She never pointed people to Christ. Never saw Jesus Christ as her only savior, as her mediator. In her book, Life in the Spirit, Reflections, Meditations, and Prayers, she wrote this. We never try to convert those who receive uh, aid from missionaries of charity to Christianity, but in our work, we bear witness to the love of God's presence, and if Catholics, Protestants, Buddhists, or agnostics become better for this, better men, simply better, we will be satisfied. Mike Gendron wrote, wrote this, the widespread perception that Mother Teresa sought to relieve the suffering of the poor was the furthest thing from the truth. She believed suffering would help the poor make satisfaction for their sins. This is consistent with Roman Catholic theology, which declares that the sinner must make satisfaction for or expiate his sins by doing penance. Gritting it out in your own effort, all that work, all that labor, which Mother Teresa is renowned for, done in an effort to earn God's favor, doing penance for her sin. At the end of her life, it's the point of this article in Time Magazine, Mother Teresa doubted the existence of God. In her letters, she wrote, Lord, my God, you have thrown me away as unwanted and unloved. I call, I cling, I want, and there is no one to answer. No, no one. Where is my faith? There is nothing. I have no faith. To face death, to face God, to face judgment with that kind of faithless, joyless, existence is horrendously terrifying and empty. God's love for his own, the love that Jesus Christ has for his own is a settled reality. Start to finish a completed thought as he loved his own who were in the world, he loves them all the way to the end. And because of who Jesus Christ is, is and because of what he did, you can have joy in him. You can trust him, you can put your faith in him, and you can have joy and peace and rejoicing in your heart, boldness in the day of judgment, because of him, because of what he has done, because of God's goodness and grace and mercy in the gospel. Fill your heart with joy in that. We get that from the word of God. 
right? We get that from God's testimony, God's revelation to us. You get that by having God's spirit within you, testifying with your spirit that you are a child of God. Amen. We can rejoice in that. And when you face death, you can have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. It's a glorious, glorious thought. Let's pray. Father in heaven, praise be to you. Praise be to your name forever and ever. Worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive glory and honor and blessing and power and strength and majesty and dominion. We praise you and worship you for this glorious salvation to which we have been delivered. We praise you and worship you that it's not by our own works, by our own penance, by our own gritting it out that we trust in ourselves for that, but we trust in the Son of God who died and gave himself for us. We trust in him for who he is. We trust in his work and what he's done. We trust in that substitutionary atonement, that substitutionary death, that sacrifice that he completed on our behalf such that we could be made right with our God who created us to glorify him forever. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for this blessed return, this return to the, the conditions of the garden, so to speak, where we can for all eternity joy in the abiding love of God for us, joy in his presence forevermore, have fellowship with our creator. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for this blessed joy. Be with us now as we go. Lord, help us to live in light of that joy. Help us to abide in that love, abide in that delighting love of God by keeping his commandments, knowing that we in our own strength can't do that. All that is done through faith in Christ. Help us to have faith, Lord. We believe, help our unbelief. Lord, teach us, Lord. Instruct us by your spirit, strengthen us, empower us to live in the reality of that abiding love for your glory, God. And we know it's for our good. We love you, Lord. We delight in the thought that you delight in us. Help us to live in the reality of that delight. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you for this beautiful passage of scripture. In Jesus' name, amen.